Hello, celestial seekers and curious minds. You're tuned into Celestial Chronicles, your gateway to the hidden truths and untold stories of our past. In today's episode, we're peeling back the layers of history to uncover the origins of one of the most controversial figures in religious narratives, Lucifer, or as he's commonly known, Satan. From the ancient lands of Mesopotamia to the complex theological debates of modern times, we'll explore how the concept of evil has transformed and persisted through the ages. We'll dive into the dualistic battles of good versus evil, witness the transformation of Satan from a mere adversary to a symbol of darkness, and see how this figure has influenced not just religious texts but entire cultures. Expect to hear about The Ancient Roots of Evil in Human Society The Persian Influence on Jewish Conceptions of Satan How Satan's Role Evolved in Jewish Tradition and the New Testament The Cultural Tapestry that Shaped the Portrayal of This Dark Prince and the protective measures humanity has crafted to shield itself from his influence. So, grab your armor of curiosity, and let's unravel the celestial chronicles of Lucifer. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and join us on this enlightening voyage. Let the chronicles begin. Lucifer, or the adversary, stands out as a prominent figure in the historical narratives of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam in the Western sphere. Interestingly, this figure emerged relatively late in ancient history. Lucifer, portrayed as a holy malevolent entity, does not feature prominently in the Jewish scriptures. His development took shape during the zenith of the Persian Achaemenid Empire around 550 BCE and gained traction among Jewish communities under Persian dominion at that time. His formal title, Lucifer, originates from the Hebrew term Ha-Satan, where Ha signifies the and Satan connotes opposer or adversary. This designation encapsulates his eventual role as the antagonist of divine creation. The Greek term, diabolos, translated into English as, devil, conveys the notions of, accuser, and, slanderer, further delineating his function. The conception of Lucifer unfolded gradually and underwent various phases of evolution. The predicament of evil's existence. Evil has perpetually endured. Humanity has faced natural calamities, such as earthquakes and floods, conflicts featuring plunder and violation, illnesses, plagues, and infant fatalities, as well as man-made atrocities like murders and thefts, and inevitably, death. As ancient civilizations developed their religious frameworks, they grappled with explaining and justifying the presence of evil. Creation narratives frequently attributed control over everything, including both good and evil, to a supreme deity or a king among the gods. This capacity was often described as omnipotence, all-powerful. In Deuteronomy 28, God asserts dominion over both prosperity and adversity. Numerous creation stories delved into the origins and causes of evil. Genesis can be interpreted as a rebuttal to neighboring ancient Mesopotamian beliefs. In the Mesopotamian creation epic, the Enuma Elish, the gods themselves bore responsibility for evil. They were portrayed as whimsical and disorderly, creating humans solely as servants for offering sacrifices. In contrast, the God of Israel is depicted as the antithesis, never capricious, with a discernible divine plan, and everything fashioned by him is deemed inherently good. The fall narrative in the Garden of Eden, the tale of Adam and Eve, aimed to illustrate that evil originated from human disobedience, not divine intervention. Their transgression resulted in humanity's toil for sustenance and women's agony during childbirth. However, the most severe consequence was the forfeiture of their immortality. Adam and Eve's sin ushered in the greatest evil, death. As their descendants, we are all subject to this fate. Human beings, in their humanity, projected their own experiences onto their perceptions of the divine. Just as earthly kings held courts of nobles and counselors, so too did they envision celestial realms. Analogous to earthly hierarchies, celestial realms featured higher and lower ranking officials. In Judaism, the higher echelons were occupied by angels. The lower deities, known as demons in Greek mythology, were initially neutral but gradually became scapegoats for evil. In Genesis, God addresses his celestial court, referred to as the sons of God, or angels, as he embarks on the act of creation. Concluding the creation account, Genesis 6 presents a peculiar passage wherein, the sons of God, engage in relations with human women, resulting in the birth of the Nephilim, ancient giants. This narrative serves to elucidate why God unleashed the flood, a manifestation of evil upon the earth. Many mythologies featured gods engaging in relationships with mortal women, particularly Zeus in Greek mythology. However, Israelite tradition disavowed such behavior, 
fearing it could precipitate the grave sin of idolatry. The ancient text of the Book of Job, dating back to around 600 BCE, is the earliest known work grappling with the dilemma of theodicy, questioning why a supposedly benevolent God allows evil and suffering to exist. The narrative begins with a scene where angels, including the figure known as Ha-Satan, or the Accuser, present themselves before God. Ha-Satan's role is depicted as that of a sort of divine prosecutor, traveling the world to present challenges or obstacles to humanity, thereby prompting moral choices between good and evil. He brings up Job, a man whom God has favored abundantly. A wager is struck between God and Ha-Satan. God allows Ha-Satan to strip away all of Job's blessings, with the exception of his life, confident that Job's faith will remain unshaken. Job loses his children, his wealth, and is afflicted with agonizing illnesses. Throughout his trials, Job's friends try to convince him that his suffering is a result of his own wrongdoing, as they believe in a just God. But Job maintains his innocence, insisting that his suffering is undeserved. In his desperation, he challenges God to explain his suffering, and God's response from the whirlwind is a reminder of the vastness and inscrutability of divine wisdom, essentially telling Job that his perspective as a mortal is limited. Ha-Satan is a rarely mentioned figure in Jewish scripture, appearing primarily as an adversary to humans rather than to God directly. In the story of Eden, for instance, the serpent serves a similar role by tempting Adam and Eve with the choice of disobedience. Throughout the prophetic books, human sin, particularly the sin of idolatry, is often depicted as the cause of evil and suffering, with God depicted as administering justice upon Israel. When Jerusalem fell to the Neo-Babylonian Empire in 587 BCE, a portion of the Jewish populace found themselves in Babylonian captivity. Subsequently, Cyrus the Great overthrew the Babylonians in 550 BCE, establishing the Persian Empire. Zoroastrianism, attributed to the teachings of the prophet Zoroaster, held sway as the dominant religious practice within Persia. Within this belief system, evil stood diametrically opposed to good, with Ahura Mazda, the wise lord, embodying purity and goodness, while Druj, signifying chaos, represented its antithesis. This chaos found its personification in Angramanu, also known as Araman. The cosmic duality extended to encompass the heavens, the earth, and humanity. Under Cyrus's reign, Jews were permitted to return to Jerusalem in 539 BCE, although some opted to remain in Babylon. Alongside them, they carried aspects of Persian religious tradition, amalgamating the concept of chaos personified with earlier interpretations of Ha-Satan. Consequently, Ha-Satan evolved into simply Satan, or Diabolos in Greek, representing the epitome of evil, as Jews began attributing all malevolence to Satan rather than to God. The Dead Sea Scrolls unveiled the ancient writings of the Essene Jewish community settled at Qumran around 150 BCE, introducing a distinctive approach known as the personification of malevolence. Within their literature, Satan is not merely synonymous with wickedness but is specifically aligned with dissenting factions, including those within Judaism diverging from their own beliefs. Their texts posit that humanity harbors two spiritual inclinations, one towards enlightenment and the other towards darkness. Demons, under Satan's sway, are dispatched to inhabit those inclined towards darkness, prompting malevolent deeds. The Essenes attribute symbolic titles to Satan and his cohorts, such as Belial, Hebrew for worthless, who is prophesied to lead the sons of darkness. In a final confrontation against the forces of light, the War Scroll. This introduces a hierarchical structure within Satan's dominion akin to the celestial hierarchy of angels and archangels. Among the scrolls found at Qumran, various apocalyptic writings shed light on the celestial rebellion. The books of Enoch expound upon the transgressions of the sons of God, who were cast out of heaven and imprisoned in the abyss, an analogue to Sheol, the realm of the deceased, for imparting forbidden knowledge of metallurgy and magic to humankind. In another text, Jubilees, additional insights into the figure of Satan emerge. Referred to as Mastema, meaning, hated, or, hostility, Satan is depicted as aspiring to surpass God and leading a rebellion resulting in his descent into the abyss alongside his fellow rebellious angels. Mastema pleads with God to retain a fraction of the demons to continue tempting humanity, arguing that human depravity warrants ongoing divine intervention. With divine consent, Mastema assumes the role of the tempter, woven into earlier narratives. In Jubilees, Mastema is granted permission to test Abraham through the trial of sacrificing Isaac, reinforcing the notion of God's omnipotence, 
wherein Satan's actions are contingent upon divine allowance. The New Testament. Within the epistles of Paul and the narratives of the Gospels, the prevailing notion emerges that Satan presently holds dominion over the world. This sentiment finds articulation in a missive penned by one of Paul's adherents. Equip yourself with the complete armor of God, enabling you to withstand the cunning schemes of the devil. For our contention is not against mere mortals, but against the principalities, against the authorities, against the dominions of this shadowy realm, and against the malevolent spiritual entities in heavenly realms, Ephesians 6 verses 11 to 12. Paul frequently alluded to demons as the emissaries of Satan who impeded his missionary endeavors. Corresponding from confinement, Paul elucidated his inability to visit his congregation, because Satan thwarted us, 1 Thessalonians 2 verses 17 to 18. Paul's internal conflicts were articulated in what might be construed as a manifestation of possession, and to prevent me from being too uplifted, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. 2 Corinthians 12, 7, 9. Paul interpreted this as God's capacity to manipulate Satan to test him. His recurring assertion, that believers now dwell in Christ, denoted Christ's safeguarding against the sway of Satan's minions in the cosmos. The devil assumes a prominent role in the earliest gospel, Mark, circa 70 CE. Mark employed a familiar archetype to depict Jesus' ministry, portraying him as a charismatic exorcist who both preached and performed miracles across the Roman Empire. Charismatic, from Greek, gifts, implies that their abilities were bestowed by the divine. An exorcist was one who expelled demons. By the first century, afflictions, both physical and mental, were construed as demonic possession. Mark underscored Jesus' ministry as a confrontation between Jesus and the current regime of the devil on earth. Immediately the Spirit impelled him into the wilderness, where he spent forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was among the wild animals, with angels ministering to him, Mark 1 verses 12 to 13. Notably, Mark did not find it necessary to elucidate the character of Satan, he presumed his audience's familiarity. Both Matthew and Luke elaborated on this episode, Matthew 4 verses 1 to 11, Luke 4 verses 1 to 13. In his capacity as the tempter, Satan presented Jesus with three temptations, yet Jesus unfailingly countered with scriptural responses. It holds significance that Jesus did not contest Satan's assertion of control over the world's kingdoms. While the disciples in Mark's account often grappled with Jesus' identity, all the demons recognized him and acknowledged his supremacy. In Mark 5 verses 1 to 13, the collective moniker of the demons exorcised by Jesus is Legion, perhaps Mark's subtle commentary on the Roman military. Mark and his counterparts depicted Jesus' adversaries as being under Satan's influence. In Luke and John, Satan entered into Judas to betray Jesus, Luke 22 verse 3. The apex of blame for Jesus' demise was reached in John 8 verse 40. According to John's Gospel, the Jews cannot attain salvation because they are offspring of their true father, the devil. Lucifer became the most popular moniker in the Middle Ages. The Book of Revelation, around 90 to 100 CE, by John of Patmos presents an apocalyptic vision of divine intervention in human affairs during the final days, foreseeing retribution upon Rome for its persecution of Christians. It includes the notion of Satan being confined in the depths of hell, operating through intermediaries. The principal intermediary is termed the beast or the deceiver, with the concept of antichrist appearing in the Johannine letters rather than revelation. The deceiver is prophesied to masquerade as benevolent, amassing followers worldwide, identified by the mark of 666. In one of John's visions, he alludes to Isaiah 14, a critique of the Babylonian king. Isaiah admonishes the king, who arrogantly likened himself to a divine being. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. When Jerome translated the Hebrew scriptures into Latin in the 4th century CE, he recognized that the Romans referred to their morning star as Lucifer, derived from the planet Venus, and translated the passage accordingly. Thus, Lucifer gained popularity as a name during the Middle Ages. For much of Revelation, Satan is depicted as imprisoned. However, towards the end of Christ's supposed 1,000-year rule on earth, Satan is released for a final confrontation. The paradox lies in Christ being portrayed as a lamb, yet triumphing over this adversary. Satan is ultimately cast into the lake of fire, symbolizing a final defeat, Revelation 20 verses 1 to 5. The harrowing of hell. In Acts of the Apostles, Luke asserts that Hades, Sheol, couldn't confine the crucified Christ, 
2.27. According to 1 Peter 3, Jesus preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago, and 4 6, the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead. By the 2nd century CE, the narrative of Jesus' death was embellished to address two questions. What occurred between Good Friday and Easter Sunday? How could righteous individuals from the past attain salvation without knowledge of Jesus? During the time his body lay in the tomb, Jesus' soul descended to hell, engaging in a battle with Satan for the souls of the righteous. When the stone was rolled away, these righteous souls emerged with him, including Adam, Noah, Moses, Plato, and Aristotle. This concept of Christ's descent into hell was incorporated into the 4th century Nicene Creed, evolving into the harrowing of hell narrative in the early Middle Ages. Harrowing originally meant raid or incursion, akin to Viking raids. Characteristics of Satan and the personification of evil. The earliest representations of Satan were inspired by the Greco-Roman fertility god, Pan, who was half-man, half-goat. In the 2nd century CE, Christian leaders adopted the tactic of personifying evil, targeting Jews, women, heretics, and pagan practices. Indigenous cults believed their gods resided in temples, which were deemed agents of Satan. The initial iconic depictions of Satan drew inspiration from the Greco-Roman deity Pan, featuring a half-man, half-goat figure. This imagery endowed Satan with hooves and horns, traits attributed to Pan. Pan, known for his prominent phallus, influenced the portrayal of Satan with a similar attribute, initially depicted in black but later associated with the color red, symbolizing hellfire. In the 2nd century CE, both early Christians and Jewish scholars, known as the early rabbis, began reinterpreting the tale of the fall. During this time, the serpent came to be seen as the devil in disguise, and Eve assumed a more prominent role as the primary transgressor in the Garden of Eden. Holding misogynistic beliefs about women, Eve was portrayed as being seduced by the serpent, often depicted with a prominent phallus, and then enticing Adam into sin. In Genesis Rabbah, a rabbinic text, Eve's sexual shame was cited as the reason for women veiling themselves, and menstruation was considered a punishment for shedding Adam's blood. Tertullian, a church father from the 2nd century CE, famously declared that all women were the devil's gateway through Eve, leading to the death of the Son of God, on the apparel of women, I. European religious traditions, including Celtic, Druidic, and Teutonic beliefs, contributed additional elements to this narrative. The Celts revered Cernanos, a horned deity akin to Pan, associated with the West. The daughter of Loki was believed to embody both fertility and dominion over the realm of the dead, with her name eventually lending itself to the concept of hell or hell. Lucifer and his demons were thought to possess the ability to shapeshift into animal forms, necessitating constant vigilance. Various protective measures such as making the sign of the cross, using holy water, reciting the rosary, and consuming communion wafers were believed to ward off Lucifer's influence. Feudal relationships inspired the notion of entering into a pact with Lucifer in exchange for worldly success, famously illustrated in the story of Faust. It was believed that only the intervention of Mary, the mother of Christ, could annul such pacts. Consequently, exorcism rituals were developed, which are still practiced by certain Catholic priests to this day.